Hi, my name is Molly Gaston. I'm a junior at Chapel Street and I'm 16 years old. This past June, I was given the opportunity to go on a mission trip to Ecuador with about 75 other students and leaders from the church. I'm Jacob Van Rossum. I am 17 and I'm a senior at Geneva High School. I felt called to go to Ecuador because it's a trip with just a bunch of different people and just a bunch of new experiences that I don't feel like it's something that I would be able to see and feel here in America. Mainly we were there to serve El Refugio, which is this amazing retreat center for missionaries. The El Refugio team is a mix of people. Some are from Chapel Street, some are from just different parts of the world, different parts of Ecuador, and they speak different languages. Like some of them speak fluent Spanish, some of them both English and Spanish. So it's really cool just to see like all these different people working together. So going to El Refugio, the impact for me, six months prior, I'd say, leading up to it, I'd pray every day uh, about prayer. And in specific, I wanted opportunities to be able to pray in front of people or pray with people, pray in front of larger groups, really. I didn't tell Tom Ward about this prayer of mine, but multiple times he called on me to pray in front of our whole group in Ecuador. One time it was even at the church service and we were ending service and Tom just called on me. He goes, Jacob, you wanna pray us out? And I was like, whoa, that is, God, what? This is my prayer right here. I think around like the middle of our trip to Ecuador, we went to this woman's home called Casa Tau and it was made up of women from ages 12 to early 20s who had children of their own or a child of their own. And this woman named Anna had taken them under her wing and really just showed them God's love through her, her guidance and her comfort. And just being in that house, it was, you could just feel the overwhelming amount of joy. And I will never forget like the presence of God in that house. And I just remember one of the women who was 18 years old, she was able to share her testimony with us. And it was very emotional. And I remember just the contrast of feeling both so heartbroken for what she had gone through, but also so joyful for how it led her to God. I think that moment really showed to me that God's joy is greater than anything we'll ever go through. Like you can always find joy even in those hard times. A lot of times when we think of serving, we think that we have to have this special talent or this special calling to serve. But Ecuador really showed me that there's so many different opportunities to serve no matter who you are. I remember specifically uh, the VBS that we did, which is like the vacation Bible school for the kids of the town. And there were so many, I think there were like 300 kids there. To see those kids who only spoke Spanish, maybe like a little bit of English, and us who mainly spoke only English, interacting without even having to speak the same language was the coolest moment ever because we really saw that God's love doesn't have a language. Okay, so my group and I in Ecuador, we did a challenge to where we'd find three things throughout the day. And in the moment, we'd pray. So if you were, if you saw something amazing, you'd thank God for that. So you just say, thank you, Lord, for these amazing mountains that you've placed in front of us right here. You'd pray for something that was affecting you. Or the third part was just find a time that you can just pray and just talk to God. And then after that, something I've worked on is listening, finding times to read your Bible and listen to what the Lord has to say for you. Two students like presented with the opportunity to go to a trip like Ecuador or Twin Cities even, I just want to urge you to take that opportunity because it is such an amazing chance to grow closer to God as you also grow closer to this community of people who follow God. And even if it's something that causes you to come step out of your comfort zone, I just recommend going on these trips and pushing yourself a little bit because you'll know so much more about God, but you'll also know so much more about yourself and about the people in your community. The mission trip in Ecuador was so significant for me because just looking back, that I always think of is how God's love was so eminent throughout the whole entire trip. Being able to see how he looks so similar in different people was definitely the biggest takeaway from the trip.
Some of you may not know this, but in, I came here in 1999 as high school pastor. So my best memories were taking trips to Ecuador before that El Refugio property was even owned and developed yet. And so um, it's just, uh, I, I hope it does for your heart what it does for mine to see students of the next generation discovering who God is in different cultures, what it means to serve him, how to talk to him and hear from him in prayer. There's a lot of talk today about the concerns over what's happening in the next generation, but, uh, and fair enough, but I have a lot of hope because of students like that. And I want to say to all of you who pray for them and who give financially to support those ministries and the ministries of Chapel Street Church, you're making a difference. You're helping the next generation discover uh, that faith really does work, uh, which is the, the theme of our series. And so thank you for that. Thanks for being gracious and generous. And it's a full house this morning, which is great. And so if you, hey, if you're thinking, I don't like everybody sitting right next to me, you could come at 8 or at 11. We have space for you. But we're glad that you're here either way. Let's bow in prayer and ask God to speak to us through his word. Father, we thank you for being so gracious to us. We thank you for the way that you're working in our lives, moving in our hearts. We pray now that you would speak to us through your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, I'm going to ask you to stand as we read from our text for the series, James chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. I'll read and you can follow along. My brothers and sisters, as believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, do not show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in shabby clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there or sit on the floor by my feet, have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brothers and sisters. Has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom? He promised to those who love him. But you have insulted the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are slandering the noble name of him to whom you belong? If you really keep the royal law found in scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but you do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. Because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. This is God's word. You may be seated. Now, I will admit that sometimes uh, we read the Bible, if you do, hopefully you do, and you come across passages that you think, I don't know what this means. Anybody? Right? I'm not sure how to translate this into my life. How does this apply to me? Sometimes it seems so far removed from us and we struggle to understand it. That happens even to me. Uh, who's given my life to studying and preaching the word. But that's not true with James. Whatever you say about James's letter, he's intensely practical and relevant and straight in your face. Uh, that's his intent. James, the brother of Jesus. It's remarkable how this ancient letter, written to Jewish believers spread around the, the Roman Empire in the first century, has so much to say to us today in our cultural moment. Now keep in mind that Christianity begins as a sect within Judaism. In fact, early on, the, the, the people in the Roman world weren't sure, are these Jews or not? What's the difference? And Judaism itself is a minority religion inside the Roman Empire. So Christianity begins as a minority within minorities. That's our roots, as it were, socially speaking. In verse 2, James talks about how a wealthy person comes in to our meeting or our gathering. The word used there for meeting or gathering is the Greek word. Uh, it's not the usual word, ekklesia, which refers to the gathering of the church, it, uh, the most common use of that phrase. It's a different Greek word, synagoge. It's where we get our word synagogue from. He's saying you were once Jews, met in the synagogue, now you're Christians and you're gathering to worship Christ. In the Jewish synagogue, by the way, there were uh, social, religious, and economic seating charts. Essentially, there was a strata in their worship based on your rank. And in a sense, James is saying the Christian gathering, 
those who belong to Jesus should not be like that. You're different. He reminds of Jesus' warning in Luke 20 that the, the, the religious leaders, the Pharisees, the relig religious elites, those who had status in the culture, loved to sit in the most important seats in the synagogues and places of honor at banquets. So James is saying Christian gatherings are not to be like this. But addition, beyond that, he's just saying in general, in human terms, all of us, there is this tendency to tilt ourselves, incline ourselves, lean toward those who are important, who society thinks are influential, powerful, wealthy. Like, I don't know, like if somebody walked in in the back door there, I don't know who, who, who was, Taylor Swift, eh, whatever. Somebody that you think is great. Like even if you didn't follow them, there would be a natural inclination for all of us like, oh, so-and-so's here. We would lean that way. It's just normal because the influence, the status, the wealth of that person. James is saying that's not the way it's supposed to be in the family of God. Pew Research study shows us that Americans in general are growing increasingly skeptical of the rich as a group. You know, the rich should pay their fair share. The rich, uh, we should have more wealth distribution. And so there's, as a whole, American society is growing increasingly skeptical of the rich, meaning the rich sort of the, the grouping. But, interestingly, when it comes to individuals, we still tend to favor individually those who are wealthy and influential. In this passage, James is really not talking about the blessings or pitfalls of having wealth. The Bible has a lot to say about that. But that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about how we, the people of God, the family of God, treat one another based on status. Look at verse 1 again of James chapter 2. My brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, must not show favoritism. So if you belong to Jesus, you must not do this. We'll talk about what this is in a minute. But his reasoning is right there in the statement. Believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. Actually, in the Greek construction, it reads like this. Jesus Christ, Lord of the glory. What's he saying here? In light of the glory of Christ. What does a gold ring, fine clothes, or a nice car mean? Like, why on earth would you favor those things when you belong to the Lord of glory, the King of heaven and earth? Those things shouldn't impress you and shouldn't matter to you because you belong to the glorious Lord Jesus Christ. This word favoritism, sometimes translated partiality, it's a, it's a Greek word that does not show up anywhere outside of the New Testament, which is interesting because I think it was probably invented by New Testament authors to communicate something profound about God's people. I won't try to pronounce it for you. Well, actually I will. Prosopolemptes. Isn't that fun? To accept or to receive the face of someone. And that's kind of a double meaning. On the one hand, it means to accept something or someone on the, fa on the face of it. Surface level judgments. You look wealthy. You look important. You look beautiful. I like you. I like your face. You don't look so good. I'm not so sure about your face. But it also means, it has a double meaning in this for Christians when it comes to the favor of God, which we'll get to in a minute. Now, in one sense, James is saying, we are not to accept or favor the wealthy or powerful simply because of their status in society. You get the idea. This face, not this face. Like for, like for what does it mean, just physically speaking, if you're talking to someone and they just go, they just turn away. They just turn their face away from you. What does that communicate to you? That they're interested? That they care about what you have to say? That they're present with you? No, it communicates the opposite. But to look at someone, like, parents, why do we grab our kids by the cheeks? When we look at your face, you know? Like, I want to look you in the face. To turn your face toward those with economic or social status and away from those without cuts right against who we are to be as God's people. God is not like this. Peter learned this lesson in Acts chapter 10. Some of you might know this story. He's given a vision about, uh, that God accepts all people. He's profoundly moved by this, and he has this exclamation. The King James puts it this way. Peter declares he understands that God is no respecter of persons. God doesn't play favorites. Doesn't see it that way. We inherently do. Even if we're good on the outside of pretending like everybody's the same, internally we're making judgments all the time about one another. God accepts the face of anyone who submits and, return and turns to him humbly and seeks his grace. 
Regardless of their economic status, their social status, their racial status, their religious background, their ethnic status. Anyone who turns to God, he receives their face and shines his face on them in Christ. This is why the great blessing of the priestly blessing given to Aaron to give to all the priests for God's people in Numbers chapter 6, we often end services with this benediction. Here's a portion of it. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. What does it mean to have God's face turned toward you? It means the favor of God. He's favoring you. This is why the psalmist in Psalm 27 writes, Do not turn your face from me. Don't hide your face from me. Don't turn away, Lord. The face of God connected with the favor of God. All over scripture. This is who God is and what he's done. Paul writes it this way in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, made us light, made the light shine in our own hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, if God has turned his face toward you in Christ, how could you possibly turn your face away from somebody else made in his image? Who are we to turn away from the face of anyone? This is the point of the not-so-hypothetical example James gives about two people entering the gathering. One looking sharp, put together, like most of you this morning. A few exceptions, most of you look pretty good, right? Fine clothes, nice car, looking good, Sunday best. Somebody else walks in, and it's clear by the sight and the smell they haven't showered in weeks. And maybe you're thinking, that wouldn't be my issue. Well, what would be? You have them. I talked to a man after last service who said, this sermon was from my heart because I work in corrections and I deal with the dregs every day and it's so hard not to become hardened and judgmental toward people in the rest of my life. I needed to hear this because I have to make judgments about like for the safety and security and I have to deal with people and I can't be naive, but it's causing me to be judgmental toward people in the rest of my life. We all make judgments. What a sketchy neighborhood. Well, they've made bad choices. We make judgments in our hearts. And in that sense, we favor those who are like us. This is the point of what James is saying. There's a fundamental human tendency to favor those who are like us and who have power and to exclude those, even unintentionally, who are different from us and those without status. Look at verse 5 again of chapter 2. Listen, my dear brothers and sisters, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world, the unfavorable, to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised to those who love him? This is amazing. James is pointing out the fact that our whole story as followers of Jesus is that God didn't do it the way we would do it. Like if you were going to start a world religion that's going to shape all of civilization, going to be remembered 2,000 years later, still going strong, how would you do it? Well, human wisdom would say, well, you need to get people of power and influence. You're going to need resources. You're going to need people in positions that can give you favor and protect you. And so let's start at the top, convert the wealthy and powerful and the influential, and it'll trickle down. It always does. That's not at all how God did it. God did it the opposite. Here's how the Apostle Paul puts it in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. Do you catch what he's saying? There are a few, but most of the first believers, and frankly, still today, most of those following Jesus, are not wise or influential or powerful or famous. They're just humble people seeking to follow Christ. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. This is interesting for a minute. Let me just take a minute here and look at this. Foolish, weak, Lowly, despised. How many, of you, how many of you aspire to be those things? My goal in life is to be foolish, weak, lowly, and despised. <laughs> but Paul actually flips it around later in, this, and he, in 1 Corinthians. He'll say, I boast in my weakness because of the grace of Jesus. 
I glory in him and boast in my weakness because he's turned that upside down. It's what God does. Now, of course, of course, God loves all people, including the rich. God's not opposed to the rich. He's not against the wealthy. He loves Taylor Swift, even if you don't. The point is God loves all people. His mercy is extended to all. The point is, though, God also favors, tilts toward, leans toward those who the culture ignores. And by the way, just so we're clear, if you own your own home, if you own a car, even if you're making payments, or cars, if you have a closet full of clothes, multiple shoes to put on your feet, if you're not thinking or worried about where your meal will come from next week, if you have a job to go to, you are among the richest one half of 1% in the world. We just compare ourselves to the wrong standard. Okay, three reasons why this showing of favoritism, turning the face toward or away from, is a contradiction to our faith. Reason number one, it runs counter to the character of God. It would be easy to assume that the opposite of favoritism is just to be neutral. You know, like, okay, well, okay, I get it, I get it, Pastor Jeff. Like, we shouldn't lean toward those who are powerful, rich, and famous, or influential, or can do something for us. We should treat everybody the same. Is that what God is saying? Well, actually, that's not exactly how the Bible frames it. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 10. For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who shows no partiality, plays no favorites, in other words, and accepts no bribes. He defends the cause of the fatherless and widow and loves the foreigner residing among you, giving them food and clothing. And you are to love those who are foreigners, for you yourselves were foreigners in Egypt. I don't know if you catch this. Verse 17, God plays no favorites. Verse 18, God favors widows, immigrants, and orphans. Verse 19, we should do the same. Right after saying that God doesn't play favorites, it seems to indicate that God favors these people. Here's what he, it doesn't mean he loves them more. It means God inclines his heart toward those to whom the society leans away from. And so should we, because that's our story, spiritually speaking. God shows his special favor toward those that society does not. This is not a political statement, friends. It's a profoundly biblical one. It gets politicized, and some of us have the wrong filters. We can't help but hear things in a socio-political way. I'm just talking about the heart of God for his people in the world. Let me put it to you this way. If God's face is toward the poor and the forgotten, then what does it say about us if we turn our face away from anyone? Let me try to explain it. One, this definition here. The opposite of favoritism. So we're not supposed, supposed to show favoritism. We must not, because of the glorious Lord Jesus. So what are we supposed to do? The opposite of favoritism is not neutrality. It is the tilting of favor toward those in need. I suppose neutral would be good if we still lived in the Garden of Eden. Like if we still lived in a perfect society, in a perfect world, then just treating everybody the same would be good. It would work. But we don't live there. We live east of Eden. The world is broken. It's full of sin and injustice. And to be reflect God's heart means we must lean the way he leans, which is toward those who are hurting, who are oppressed, who are held down. The real problem with favoritism is not that things are uneven. The world has been and it always will be, apart from Jesus coming back, uneven. The problem is we just tend to favor the wrong kind of people. We tend to lean the wrong way in our hearts. I love the way C.S. Lewis puts this idea in his classic essay uh, and sermon, The Weight of Glory. By the way, just this, this week, I had a chance to be with a, one of our sub-30 small groups uh, at the home of Ethan and Alyssa Adams, and like 15 uh, young people in their 20s and 30s, and they had been reading C.S. Lewis, so I got to go to their group, and for two hours we talked about C.S. Lewis. It was awesome. <laughs> for me, hopefully for them, I don't know. Right? Here's what he writes in this essay. There are no ordinary people You've never talked to a mere mortal. Nations, cultures, arts, civilizations, these are mortal, and their life is to ours the life of a gnat. But it is immortals whom we joke with, work with, marry, snub, and exploit. He's talking about the Imago Dei, the image of God. Every person bears a, glim a, a weight of the divine glory put in them by God when he made them in his image. Civilizations, empires, nations rise and fall. 
But every human life made in the image of God has an eternal destiny, one of two. We just don't take that seriously enough. We don't see people that way. Some of you know Danny Flores, pastor of a church in Elgin, who's become a dear friend of mine and a partner with our our church. We're partnering with his church called Our Church, which is confusing, I admit. But uh, we're launching a Spanish-speaking congregation, a new church uh, at Easter this year called Capilla. Para todos y para donde estés. For everyone, wherever you are. Fits right with who we are. So two churches coming together to launch a new church this Easter. Uh, and Danny's a remarkable guy doing amazing ministry. They do something called Taco Tuesdays. You'll see an image here on the screen. Taco Tuesdays is, uh, it beats on Tuesday and they serve tacos. So you get the idea for the name. But in addition to that, they give out clothing and school supplies uh, and food. And also they have a prayer and a tent for people that are in, hurting and in need. And most of the people that come there are really broken, really hurting. They are those that the world does not favor. And, and they have a lot, of, a lot of issues, addiction, mental health, all kinds of things, just brokenness. He sent me this picture on the last Taco Tuesday of their season. It's getting too cold to be outside. He said, these four people are now our brothers and sisters. Send it to me. They, they all would pray to receive Christ at Taco Tuesday. And they all come from the streets in Elgin. They are your brothers and sisters. You will see their glorified faces one day when we see him face to face. James is saying, God turns his face in love and grace toward anyone who turns to him. How dare we turn our face away from anyone? Two, the second reason that that this uh, favoritism betrays our, our, our sense of who God is. It falls short of our calling as his people. Our fundamental calling is to live and to act in alignment with the character of God. Here's how James puts it in verses eight and nine. If you really keep the royal law found in scripture, love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing right, but if you show favoritism, you, are, you sin and are convicted. So this royal law is put in contrast with favoritism and condemns us if we do that. What is the royal law found in Scripture? Well, love your neighbor as yourself. And you might think, yeah, I think James's brother Jesus said something like that. He did, but actually it's older than that in the sense of where it comes from in Scripture. Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18. It's an Old Testament law. You know Leviticus, that part of the Bible that you bog down in and stop reading when you're trying to read through in a year? Right? This, is, this is part of the law, the Jewish law. Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. But there's nothing in the Old Testament that indicates that this law is royal, meaning it's better than, more, uh, more to be revered. It's just part of the law. There's nothing in the Old Testament that indicates it has special status until we come to the New Testament when Jesus, who is the King of Kings, was once asked, well, what's most important? Like, sum it up for us, Jesus. Break it down for us, Jesus. I'm a simple guy. Give me, like, the, the, what do I have to know if he, of all the law? And here's how he answered that in Mark chapter 12. The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. These aren't two commandments, but one. Love for God and love for neighbor are inextricably linked. They go together. Jesus says, if you want to you sum up the whole of my teaching and the law of God, love. Love God and love your neighbor. That's the royal law because King Jesus said so. The command to love. And love is most clearly evidenced when we extend it to those who are less lovely by the world's standards. If you love your spouse, good, you should. Your kids, of course, that's wonderful. Your family, your friends, your, the people like you that you get together with, that's great. And the world does that. But when you extend mercy and grace and forgiveness and love and service and kindness to somebody who, other than Christ, you would not even like or notice. My good friend Mike Smith lives in Tennessee now. He often remarked when he, was, uh, getting the, when he, when he came to follow Jesus, he was a blue-collar guy, very smart, but had a hard edge to him. Never went to college. He wore a shirt that said, you know, everybody wears their alma mater. It just said college <laughs> on it. But he used to make fun of like the educated, you know, including me. 
And he told me one time through tears, he's in a men's group. And all the guys in this group were, blue, were white collar guys, financial industry guys, lawyers, so on. He said, I wouldn't even like these guys if it wasn't for Jesus. I wouldn't give them the time of day, but now I love them. I love them. Well, I'll put it to you this way. Who is in your life that apart from Jesus, you wouldn't even notice or care about? Is there anyone? I think that's at the heart of what James is saying to us. And he goes on to say and show us that we cannot separate out certain parts of the law of God. This is what he means by a murder and adultery. You might think, that's a little extreme. He's just picking two of the big ones by our standards and saying, if, you, if you're faithful to your wife, but you commit murder, does that make you a law keeper? No. Or flip it around. The same is true when it comes to partiality or favoritism. Uh, Derek Kidner, who's an Old Testament commentator, said, too many of us think of the law of God like a pile of rocks. We can pick up certain rocks and leave some there. That's not how it works. The law of God is not a pile of rocks. It's a perfect mirror reflecting his perfect character. This is why David can say in the Psalms, how I, I delight in your law. I love it because it shows me the perfect heart of God. So when we break his law, fail to live up to it, we're not just leaving one rock in the pile. We are cracking the mirror that's meant to reflect God's character to the world through our love. This is why James says you, you break one part of it, you're a, you're a lawbreaker of all of it. And third, it ignores our own need for God's mercy. It ignores our own needs for God's mercy. So it runs counter to the character of God. It fails to live up to our calling as his people and it ignores our need for God's mercy. Look at verses 12 through 13 of the last part of this passage. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. A couple of things here. You're going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. Now you might be thinking, hold on, time out, Pastor Jeff. Wait a second. I thought if I'm a believer in Jesus, I'm saved by his grace. And uh, on judgment day, I, I, I have Christ, so I'm not going to be judged. Well, it's true that on judgment day, those who belong to Jesus will be saved by his grace. But it's also true that you will give an account for your life. Everyone will. And what will be the standard by which you're judged? The law that gives freedom. You might remember last week, chapter 1, verse 25, we covered this. That is the, that is the, the law that gives freedom, the royal law, are ref, ways of saying it's all of Jesus' teaching and how it fulfilled all of God's law. That's the standard. Summed up in, love God, love your neighbor. So you will be judged and I will be judged, all of us, based on how we have lived up to love God and love neighbor. You will be saved by the grace of Jesus, but we'll give an account for our life. So James just says what the scripture witnesses to. Live as if this is true. Live as if you, you are called by this law and you're going to help be accountable to this law and you've been saved by this law. So live that way. Speak and act as if that day's coming. As followers of Jesus, the law that gives freedom is because of him. In verse 13, this part sounds a little troubling. Because judgment without mercy will be shown to those, to anyone who has not been merciful. Let me ask you a question here. How many of you have failed to be merciful in your mind, with your words, or with your actions to somebody at some point in your life? Anybody? You're all doomed. <laughs> Go in peace. <laughs> it sounds like that's what he's saying. Like, ah, what is that? That's terrifying news. That, that would cut against what the New Testament is teaching everywhere else. That's not what James is saying. He's actually flipping around as a warning what his brother Jesus put as a blessing in the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes. Jesus puts it this way. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Now the wrong way to read this is, okay, okay, I am merciful, and God, if I'm merciful enough, will give me divine mercy. That's not what Jesus or James or any of the New Testament authors are saying. What they're saying is this. 
God has given you his divine mercy in Christ. And the evidence that that is true in your heart is how merciful you are to others. So if you cannot be merciful to those who are not like you, you better check yourself. You need to do a self-examination. It may be evidence that you've never received his mercy or you need to get in touch with it again because you've grown cold and hardened. That's what he's saying. Our human mercy is evidence that we have received his divine mercy. That's the point James is making. Our human mercy is the visible evidence that we have received his divine mercy. Because anybody who's experienced his grace tasted the mercy of God. It flows out of you. It has to. Just this week, how many of you saw more images and stories than you care to remember of suffering children in Israel? And now in Palestine. And we can, we can talk about the history of the conflict, but we need to call evil, evil. And, and cry out as the people of God for mercy. Mercy on the suffering of innocence. An end to the violence. Stop those who are bringing terror and, and raining down bombs. And save. Be merciful, Lord. And more than just the physical mercy, God, use this broken world that's happening all around us, but right now in the news in the Middle East, to turn many hearts to you. That they would see your face shine on them. And know your love in Christ. Here's how our friend, good friend and teacher, Dr. John Dixit, puts it in a commentary he wrote on James. Mercy is so fundamental to the life of God's people that it is the sign of, those, of, of who those people are. It's so fundamental. It's so like integrated into who we're supposed to be that it's the sign of who we are. So the question for us is, does my life, does your life, does our life collectively reflect the wideness of God's mercy in the world? Or is it a little bit narrow? Do we reflect the wideness of God's mercy? That's what James is saying to these Jewish believers 2,000 years ago and to us today. My beloved brothers and sisters, you belong to the glorious Lord Jesus. Who cares about a car or a house or a watch? Why would you lean that way? Why would you care about the, what the world cares about? You belong to Jesus, the Lord of glory. And he, in his grace, has shown you mercy. He's turned his face toward you and smiles at you and loves you. Don't turn away from anyone. Let's be the people of mercy in the world. Pray with me. Lord, Lord God, we pause now and acknowledge that we all who claim to follow you have received your mercy and your grace and we do not deserve it. You've showered us with your favor through your son Jesus and we can't earn that. We, we were spiritually lawbreakers. We're unfavorable because of our sin and yet you smile on us through Christ and you invite us in. You give us a place in your family. Lord, change our hearts and help us to reflect your mercy in the world by the way that we love others so that your mercy will triumph over judgment. We pray it in your name. Amen. Amen. Yes, amen. Somebody wanted to clap. It's okay. Yeah. Because in case you're wondering, we don't clap for the performance. It was good. We clap because of the truth the song contains and who we worship and who God is. We lift our hands and our voices and our lives in worship to him. By the way, if you, if you want to join us tomorrow morning, 7 a.m. at our South Street uh, Campus Sanctuary, anyone is welcome. We're going to gather together to pray for peace in Israel, in Palestine, in our nation, and in, in this world. Pray for gospel peace. So feel free to join us at 7 a.m. tomorrow. Now, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance to you and give you his peace. Amen.